Welcome everyone. We're so excited that you are here with us today. And um, as I mentioned, if you want to rename yourself, let us know who you are and where you're zooming in from. We're excited to get started. Um, we started Possibility Project to really begin more disruptive conversations across the sector. Um, Devin Davey and I are the co-creators, so we'll talk a little bit about who we are and what we're up to. But honestly, we wanted to um, have a space that we could take the conversations we were having in dark corners with other disruptive thinkers and friends and colleagues, and we wanted to bring it out into the larger social impact community. So that's, that's really what we're focused on doing. Um, so this is our ninth episode. And a lot of folks don't know, I think we need to do a better job of sharing, but we have a YouTube channel that has all of the previous episodes and recordings. So Devin's gonna put that in the chat. So if you've missed any of them or you wanna watch them again or share them with others, they are there on the YouTube channel. And so you can check those out. Um, we are going to use introduction guidelines that were provided to us by the amazing Nova Ren of Genesis Healing Institute. And he has given us permission to share those. And so if you um, look in the chat, you will see a link to a Google Doc that has how Nova Ren welcomes people into his community when he does these Zoom gatherings. So we're so appreciative to have that. And um, so I wanna introduce myself. My name is Heather Hiscox. I'm the CEO and founder of Pause for Change. I use the pronoun she, her. And um, just to describe, for those that might be visually impaired, my appearance, I have longish red hair with a lot more gray than I had last year. And um, I'm wearing a blue jean shirt and some fun earrings. And I have blue eyes and freckles and kind of a round face. So um, I'm so excited to be here with you. And we will have a transcript available that we are using Otter to produce. So once we do a little tweaking and edits of those funny things that it transcribes, um, we will put that out into the email that we'll send to everyone and follow up. So you can look at that. And we want to honor that um, with the land that we're on. So I am on the land that was kept and held sacred by the Odom people. And I honor these ancestral keepers of this land where I'm now living and I honor their descendants who continue to breathe sacred life into our earth. So if you are not aware of where you are, what land you occupy, um, we want to drive you to um, a phone number that you can actually text. So Devin's gonna put that in the chat. I'm not gonna read off the numbers, but if you send a message, a text message to this number and you put in your zip code, it will tell you the land that you occupy. And I know I've been having um, a lot of fun doing more research. I've been an Arizona native essentially, but I've been learning a lot more um, about history and culture and the land that I'm on. So I encourage all of you to do that as well. And we also know that territory acknowledgements are just one small part of disrupting and dismantling colonial structures. It's just one piece of it. So it's our, our starting point there. So to introduce um, a little bit more about who we are, uh, Devin Davey is a strategy consultant and my co-creator, and she helps female founders and impact leaders get unstuck by co-designing and implementing people and process solutions. So Devin's just going to post a little bit more about who she is, um, a link to her website, and a couple examples of projects that she works on. Um, I work with nonprofits, local government, and philanthropic foundations as Pause for Change to help them pursue solutions more efficiently and effectively. So to address challenges or pursue cool new opportunities in much better ways with using less resources. So that's essentially what we're both up to when we're not doing a possibility project. And like I said, we wanted to bring together a community of disruptors. Um, that's why the LinkedIn group is really fun because it's folks that have sort of raised their hand and said, I'm here, I wanna keep talking about this. And then folks that join here, We've um, compiled a group of over 1,200 people that have been watching videos online and joining us live for the different episodes. So it's exciting that we're growing this larger community of folks that really want to dismantle parts of the sector that aren't really working for all of us and just exploring what we can do differently. So, oh, let's say before we mute ourselves if you haven't already. So the goals for Possibility Project, you can see on your screen. So we wanted to bring folks together, as I said, stimulate new thinking for deeper change, explore collaboration. And that's why this topic is so important to us. 
And the fourth one we've added pretty recently, examining our own role and transformation, because we know that it starts with ourselves. So we wanna make sure that we include a little bit more action orientation in the work that we're doing. And I'm just gonna take another second and talk through the agenda of what we're going to do today. So I'm gonna talk through the why. We're gonna hear from our speakers, our amazing speakers. Uh, we're gonna do some Q and A and have small group discussions in breakout rooms. We're gonna come back and synthesize our key takeaways and then talk about next steps. So I wanna just talk about the why a tiny bit. Um, I work a lot with coalitions and collaborative um, groups and partnerships to help them use innovative strategies in their work. And I haven't seen a lot of really great <laughs> examples of super effective collaboration and collective action. It's been very frustrating. And I've seen a lot of the same dysfunctions arise um, again and again. And actually last year, and Devin's gonna put it in the chat, I wrote an article out of frustration of the 20 questions you should ask your collaborative partner before you get engaged, before you jump into working together and how we can better use empathy and experimentation in collaboration. So I hope you check that out. And the other piece of the why behind this is as Sabrina Slade talked about in one of our earlier episodes, often we don't interrogate or talk about who has access to those collaborative partnerships and how power is distributed. She talked a lot about how organizations that are part of these collectives, especially if they're not the main convener and the recipient of funds, are getting pennies on the dollar for all of the trust that they bring to community, all of the doors that they open, all of the creative ways that they engage with stakeholders, tiny, tiny investments when the money is not really spread and shared equitably and the appreciation and respect and honor for especially organizations closest to pain and closest to community are not really recognized. So um, I think that's, a, that's something I just wanna put out there is the why and it's gonna guide some of our conversations today around power and reimagining how we work together. So I am now going to introduce you to our amazing guest. I'm going to stop sharing so you can see their faces in all their glory. Um, we are going to introduce the speakers, but just we're not going to go through their whole bios because you can see that in the LinkedIn post and in the chat, which Devin has posted. But I first want to introduce Alnisa Algood. Alnisa is the founder and director of Collaboration for Good. And she's going to share an interesting story with us about all of her feline accommodations now that COVID's with us. So Alnisa, take it away. Hi. Uh, yeah, so my story is since I've been working at home, um, I mean, I worked home pre-COVID. Uh, but only like three days a week. And then I went to a co-working space. But since I've been here for so long, the cat wants to be in the office with me. And she's just been taking over more and more of my desktop space. I had a built out a L-shaped desk because I tend to use up a lot of room. And she's taken over pretty much this half of the L, like you'll see, like she has a regular bed and food and stuff over here to the side. You may not be able to see it, but she has a grass bed where the sun comes on her in the afternoon when she's laying there in it. And so that has caused me to one, add more space. Now I have like a U shape area that I work in, but the positive side is I have a ton more plants um in in the office as well so it's kind of like both an office in a green retreat area sometimes i just pick up a book and walk over to my little love seat and kind of read uh, in like the corner and so that's very nice for me oh. as well so i love it yeah, cats are demanding <laughs> Well, absolutely. And whenever I tell me some, I was like, how many plants do you have? Oh my gosh, it's like it's amazing in there. It's so pretty. And this um, room is up to like, I think 40, but some of them are really small, like little fairy plants. So I love that. I love that. And Alisa's in Madison, uh, Wisconsin. So just to give you some where, where she does all the great gardening with all those plants. Um, so Alana Irving is our, our next amazing speaker. And she is a serial social enterprise founder of tools and communities 
for radical collaboration and building commons, particularly related to money. And Alana has always been focused and driven, and she's going to tell us a story about that. <laughs> Um, yeah, when Heather asked me to think of some sort of tidbit from my story, what I said is uh, I rebelled against my parents by studying Japanese. Um, I was raised in a Jewish Taoist household. <laughs> Both of my parents studied Chinese and Eastern philosophy uh, in college, and that was a big kind of shaper of their worldview and passed that on to me. And then so when it was my turn to go to college, they were like, oh, you, you know, learning Chinese was so hard. I don't think you could do it, you know, joking. But so, you know, I'm going to go one better and learn Japanese. So <laughs> that was my major in university. Um, and my first job out of college was as a translator in Japan. And that was like a whole chapter of my of my story and kind of really shaped my worldview in some ways. I love that. I love that. So great. And do you want to tell us all a little bit about where you are in the world? Sure. Um, I am calling in from Aotearoa, New Zealand in Wellington, where it is about to be summer and tomorrow, and we're all walking upside down. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, it's, it's really cool. I was, I was raised in the US, so I kind of feel like um, I span several different cultures and then have lived in several other countries in between. And um, yeah, it, it gives me a little bit of a, a, a view on different sides of issues, I think, sometimes. I love that. Oh, it definitely brings perspective. When we had our chat with Alisa and Alana in preparation, we have the honor we get to spend an hour with our amazing speakers, just Devin and I, just learning from them and just taking amazing insights and, you know, supporting and, and encouraging them around what topics we think would be most interesting. It's really lovely, both of their perspectives that they're going to bring with us today. So we're going to jump in and get started and start to hear those perspectives. So the two questions that guide every episode and really kicked off the project when we first started it was um, talking to people and asking, what dysfunctions do you want to disappear with the virus? But I think disappear from the sector. What dysfunctions do we need to get rid of? What can be opportunities for reimagination? And the second question is, what gives you hope? What's emerging that gets you excited? You know, what resources can we learn from? What examples can you share? Those sorts of things. So we're gonna um, talk about those as well. So we're gonna have Alnisa start. And Alnisa, you're gonna answer that question of what are dysfunctions in the social sector related to collaboration and collective action? Uh, yeah, so I, I would say the dysfunctions that I try to work against, especially around collaboration, is that most people try to approach collaboration as how do you, how do you get teams to work better or how do you, um, and it, most people approach collaboration as a productivity activity. Um, you know, we want to, we need to work with this organization and we want to do it efficiently, um, as quickly as possible. We want these types of outcomes and they don't spend the time thinking of collaboration as something that's really just about the people. So for me, collaboration is about the people that you're working with in the communities that you're trying to build. And it's not a fast process, it's a slow process because you have to kind of take the time and figure out one, who do you want to work with? Who are you inviting kind of um, into the room, to the table, or just to participate in any way? Who is it that you see the potential in to create new leaders, because I think that's also another component of it. Um, the people that you work in, you're work, you working with, I think in collaborations, all have the potential to become new leaders um, and new spokespersons for kind of whatever movement you're doing. Like they don't have to be the spokesperson for your organization. I don't think you should necessarily be thinking about what can they do for you as opposed to how can you help them grow and um, what opportunities that you can provide for them. Um, now, all that said, 
I have to say, I don't think I'm an expert in collaboration <laughs> whatsoever. And definitely some of the things that I'm working on in collaboration are very hard and I'm not good at yet. Hopefully I'll keep on getting progressively better at some of the things that I want to do. But um, I mean, some of the stuff that I think I am fairly good at is things like social grace <laughs> um, and serving with grace. And I think that's just true because of one of my favorite books. Um, and I typically don't tell people I have a favorite book or favorite music or things like that because they so rapidly change in my life. But I can honestly say that one of my favorite books that I go back to frequently is called The Ice Palace That Melted Away. And it's, I think of the chapters more as a series of vignettes by um, Bill Stumpf, who was, uh, I think a product designer while he was still alive, but it basically talks about lost virtuals, that virtual virtues that technology and then just growth in an industrial area, um, not an area, but the industrial age and now the technology and the information age have started to whittle away at. And he has one of these chap one of his chapters is a just about grace in itself, which um, I like to think about in terms of, you know, um, how do you, when do you take the time to acknowledge, listen to, and learn about the people that you're working with and to bring their ideas into play for what it is that you're trying to accomplish, um, to reimagine what it is that you're trying to do from something that you've learned um, from them. And, um, yeah, I guess like that's my, like where I think about that is I think that collaboration for me is about the people and it is about to some degree bringing grace to how you work with people, even if it's slightly ungraceful, like, you know, I fail. Sometimes it's like sometimes I get busy and somebody's saying something to me and I'm just like, what is it that you don't understand? Right? <laughs> you know, <laughs> and it's just like, you know, and it's, it's sometimes you just need to take the time to listen because they can't really explain what it is. That they don't that they don't understand because they don't understand, right? They don't have like the expertise to then go back and and really say that I don't know these steps or I I don't know what you're really asking for because I don't know what the steps are in this project and um, and then other times it's something totally different. Maybe something in their life is going horribly and you're sitting there working together, trying to get something done without dealing with the fact that something in their life is going really, really bad um, for them. And in giving them like the leeway to, they don't have to talk about it to me, but if they do to actually be present and listen to them and give them to the freedom to kind of, work their way through that and sometimes just acknowledge is, you know, like, okay, maybe this is not what you should be working on today <laughs> um, for that. Um, and I would say, well, I'll say the rest of it for hope, I guess, <laughs> um, for that. I wasn't quite certain how, how much you wanted me to speak on this topic. <laughs> I love it. It was great. I, the things that you brought up, I think are so important because you talk about compassion, right? You talk about humility. You're talking about grace and listening and empathy and acknowledging that you're going to meet people where they are, right? You're going to, they get to show up as their whole person and then you can pull out their superpowers and support them. And I love that. That's great. 
So Alana, we would love to hear from you. What are some of the dysfunctions you see with uh, collaboration and collective action work as we do it right now? Yeah, it's a great question. It's a broad question. Um, but what comes to mind for me is something like a failure of imagination or uh, being stuck sort of with blinders on, focusing on a certain way of being that is, is not the only way. Um, I'm teaching a university course right now with a, a bunch of group of young people um, and it's about collective leadership. And so on the very first class, we were, you know, introducing ourselves and talking about this topic. And one of the, one of the people was like, oh yeah, but oh, maybe, maybe some of that collaboration stuff would work in a small group. But once you start scaling up an organization, you have to have a hierarchy. And I'm just like, okay, yep, hold that thought. You've obviously haven't thought beyond that, but we're going to in this course. Um, and I think that so many people, you know, they're born into their family and that's a dictatorship and they go to school and that's a dictatorship and they go to work and that's a dictatorship. And like, when are we supposed to have this experience of empowered, equitable collaboration so we can practice these skills? And if we don't practice those skills, how are we supposed to bring, build on them to build up to running a whole society democratically as we're supposed to be doing, but obviously not quite living up to. Um, and it, much less, truly imagine a post-capitalist, post-colonial, post-racist, post-hierarchical, post-patriarchal society um, and, and how everything would be. So um, a lot of times uh, when you put some of these crazy ideas out there, people will go, oh, that's not realistic. And whenever people say that, I, I often think of this uh, quote from one of my favorite science fiction authors, Ursula Le Guin. I'll just read it out here now. Um, we will be wanting the voices of writers who can see alternatives to how we live now, who can see through our fear-stricken society and its obsessive technologies to other ways of being, and even imagine real grounds for hope. We need writers who can remember freedom, poets, visionaries, the realists of a larger reality. So that phrase, the realists of a larger reality, is what I think of when people say, oh, that's not realistic, because it's like, maybe it's not realistic in that narrow frame. Um, but uh, yeah, so sci-fi is a big place that I draw some uh, inspiration from. Um, I love utopian sci-fi and there's almost none of it out there. And I think that's just such a comment on where we're at in our society right now that people are obsessed with these dystopian sci-fi stories about, you know, galactic wars and apocalypse and, you know, hundreds and hundreds of shows and books, but you have to really search for those utopian stories because I feel like people actually find them harder to imagine um, so some utopian stories are like The Dispossessed by Ursula Le Guin, um, Walk Away by Cory Doctorow, uh, The Fifth Sacred Thing by Starhawk. These are stories that, that paint what an actual alternative could look like. But even in those books, it's the story of a tiny utopia fighting for its existence against a huge like capitalist, coercive, violent dystopia next door. So I think even then, like the, the only like truly expansive utopian sci-fi that's reached the popular imagination is Star Trek, which classically is that story of, okay, it's like it's post-capitalism, it's post-equality, like we're going to go explore the universe. And I've always loved that. And they even ruined Star Trek now. The new Star Trek is like, oh, it's a dark, gritty, dystopian story of an individualistic hero. And it's like, no, please, like, come on, people, we can do better. So yeah, it's that failure of imagination uh, uh, and dreaming that I think stops us from first practicing those skills of true collaboration on a small scale in our everyday lives and then building up to doing it on the large scale in society. And I just think there's a transformational inflection point coming, surely. It could be a really apoc apocalyptic one. It could be, you know, climate change apocalypse and the implosion of democracy and everything. It could be us actually making it and leapfrogging into that utopian future. Either way, we're gonna have to sit in circles and figure it out and have the skills to sit in that circle and figure it out and have the skills to build up from there to a larger scale. So either, if you believe in the utopia or the dystopia, I think we need to practice the skills now. Oh my gosh, I love that, I love that. And it, it's so true of where how can we nurture? Like, where do we go to build these skills, right? Does it start with early childhood and, you know, in our families? How do we, how do we incorporate empowering practices and reinforcing what Alnisa was saying? Like, how do we build little leaders and young leaders with empathy and with grace and with listening skills and collaboration skills? And then, yeah, how do we scale that? 
as they're in education? How do we transform educational systems to be more supportive and empowering of new forms of learning and more expansive thinking? And how does that translate? I love that because I, I think, and there are quite a few questions <laughs> that I think a lot of people are kind of like, really, how does this work? Someone has to be in charge. You all can't run amok, you know, like someone has to be accountable. How are we gonna pull this off? So I think when we talk about, I would love for you to, to take us away and keep going, Alana. Like, how would you answer the second question around what's really, what gives you hope? What examples have you seen? What can you point to that can, that can address those questions that you typically hear and that you typically get? I would love for you to keep going deeper. Um, yeah, well, I'm a very kind of, uh, much as I just talked about um, far flung sci-fi visions, I'm like a very practical hands-on person who, who needs to be inspired by the really near term proximal next step, not just the far off vision. So I think I, and I'm also really susceptible to kind of disillusionment, like if a problem seems too big and too hard, I just feel like, oh God, why even try? So I really want to keep focused on the things that I feel like I can have an impact on. So. I guess the two places in my day to day life that I'm drawing a lot of motivation and uh, tr trust in humanity from these days um, is one uh, where I live in Aotearoa, New Zealand. It's a different kind of society. Um, I'm not going to sit here and say it's any kind of utopia and Kiwis will be the first to, um, you know, hammer that we have lots of problems here, blah, blah, blah. It's true. But I think there are uh, very practical seeds of a different kind of society here and I'm, I believe that I can uh, in, contribute to making it happen so um, probably people have paid attention a little bit to the news and how we dealt with COVID and how politics are uh, a bit different here and that is great like it's amazing to read the news and actually be like oh yes this is great this headline makes me happy for most of the headlines like that was not an experience I had when I lived in the U.S. Um, and also to feel like oh, if I, if I decide, you know, for the issues that I feel like I care about, I could actually conceivably make a difference. Whereas like, I look at people working in very big complex countries who have that and go, wow, that's amazing. I'm glad you're doing that, but I, I would be crushed if I tried to do it in that society. Um, and then also, of course, uh, I guess the immediacy and vibrance um, and presence of indigenous wisdom here um, in Aotearoa is is really clear and it's I like I play like I don't know if anybody knows the game series civilization where you like you're like an ancient civilization and then you build up to the modern era and stuff and sometimes you end up being like you're Sumeria or Babylon and then you get to the modern area and you're like a Sumerian flying fighter jets and it's just kind of this thing but then here in New Zealand it's like our indigenous people are, they never went anywhere it's not history it's now and they're uh, it's like, well, what if the indigenous people had their own television networks? And what if the indigenous people set the law of the country? And we get to see that in real time. And it's like incredibly inspiring. Um, and also the legal frameworks we have here, because our country is based on the Treaty of Waitangi, which is a, a equitable agreement between the crown and the colonial visitors and the indigenous peoples. And of course, that agreement has not been lived up to, lived up to in thousands of ways. And you know, promises have been broken and there's a lot of work to do, but the the agreement itself, which fits on a page, is incredibly inspiring as uh, a post-colonialist way of founding a country on, on equitable terms, retaining the sovereignty of indig indigenous peoples. Um, and I get to I get to work with them. I get to build tech. I get to build internet technology, and I get to um, really be shown how this different view can influence every different part of life. And um, yeah, we do things here like legal personhood for nature. Is something that comes out of um, the Maori way of uh, the worldview, basically, and that you know gives a river or a mountain legal personhood who can sit then sit around the table that we're burning, um, <laughs> and and actually have a, a stake and things, things like that. I find really inspiring. And the other thing I take my motivation and hope from is just my day to day work. So uh, that's right now with Open Collective, which is a tool for groups to come together and collaboratively raise money manage money and do that <clears throat> transparently and really in a really lightweight way. Um, and what we've seen uh, this year is a massive explosion of mutual aid groups, especially in the US and Europe, uh, like when COVID-19 hit, um, mutual aid groups popping up everywhere. And so our system allows them to immediately get up and running and be able to get and spend money without having to form a legal entity, without having to figure out, oh, you know, 
because it's really like it doesn't work if you start a neighborhood group and then it's like oh we're going to put the funding in your personal bank account and you have to pay income tax on it and stuff whatever it just removes all of that and and puts it in a neutral space and lets you do best practice around transparency and managing money um and so I, i've been inspired about how much as things are getting hard and there's unrest and challenges in different places of the world everywhere that's happening we're seeing the rise of these mutual mutual aid groups um and then also like uh, Black Lives Matter groups in the US and people responding to the West Coast fires and you know just people really like as faith in our institutions has fallen and I, I'm you know that's something that I feel like a deep grief about but uh, I can then believe in the positivity of that of that mutual aid and um, see how people are doing it day to day in, on the most practical level and, and help them in some small way. I love that. That is so that's so great. And I you have such an amazing opportunity to show that if you have the ability to shift perspective, you can create something different, right? You speak about that, but you get to live it. You get to see it in action. And so as much as we may feel constrained in the US by what we're working with, and right now it's so tumultuous. I think it's so important to see examples and to have a more global perspective than as, you know, reaching outside of what we know to solve problems and see opportunities. So Alnisa, I would love to hear from you. Uh, what gives you hope? What's emerging for you? Or what have you seen really work well and that you've experienced around collaboration and collective action? Um, I think what gives me hope is, well, I guess I should give a little bit of more background. So the organization that I founded and work with is called Collaboration for Good. And yes, we work around collaborative activities, but our real purpose is to work on economic inequity issues. Um, and so we do that by in, predominantly in the social sector or with social impact organizations and in, individuals who want to create change in the world. And so, we do that in a couple of different ways, but one of the primary ways is that we run a social good accelerator here. And we work with predominantly black and brown women. Um, and then we're taking our time and adding new competencies to that, like people with disabilities, as we learn more about what things will trigger them losing livelihood as they start learning, uh, earning more income. And, and in some ways we're doing two things. One, working around a system that's currently in place. And then two, building up people who will potentially change the system as they reach new, new heights and reputation um, for the, themselves as individuals. So um, again, for me, I think, what inspires me and what I'm hopeful for is kind of this new collective generation of leaders. And what I mean, not like necessarily a new generation, like, oh, Gen Z or things like that. Um, Cause we predominantly work with people who are Gen X and Y. So millennials, I don't think they ever gave a name to Gen X people, which is where I'm at. And, and then some like Gen Z. And, um, and so I think new, the ability to transform with new leadership um, and then to work with new people to open them up to um, newer ideas, new ways to actually get to what it is that they they want and to kind of start just thinking about stuff um reimagining does it have to be this way like alana mentioned like can we create something different so our founders and our social good accelerator which we've had three cohorts for 72 participants through those co cohorts, our goal is to actually help them create viable businesses that pay them a nice living wage, um, livable wage. And we're typically arguing, even here in Madison, Wisconsin, that they be sh should be sh shooting for something like $75,000 
a year. And we're, we're arguing that across the board, even for employees of traditional nonprofit organizations. And it's a big jump, but we're working mostly with people of color and most of those people of color are women. And, um, and there's just so much that can take a salary of $50,000 down to an actual usable income of like $28,000, which is not really all that survivable here in Madison, Wisconsin, um, you know, um, for that. Uh, so, you know, a strong like, you know, like if you accidentally have a child for whatever reason um, for it, um, if you have an un planned hospital expense <laughs> and all of these types of things, all of a sudden like you go from what people consider a quote unquote good salary to you're technically living in poverty again, <laughs> right? And then our goal was to one, train them up to also get them to buy in to what is actually a, a kind of minimal viable wage for, for people and to get them to try to implement that in as they're adding st staff um, for it. But we're also training them up to take on new leadership roles in the community. And like, we'll start, I tend to like send out like just a variety of opportunities. Like we'll create opportunities within on our organization. You went through the accelerator, you know, last year or two years ago, why don't you serve on the advisory committee um, here now? Like, why don't you help me create like this peer program? So like there's peer to peer mentoring, um, giving people kind of like opportunities to participate and then to take the lead of some of that stuff um, that we're trying to accomplish. Um, and then we're also trying to get them out in the community. It's like, well, you know, so-and-so is looking for a new board member. Have you ever considered serving on a board, a nonprofit board? You know, um, it's like, you know, and the number of people, especially with, I think, um, black and brown women who have multiple doctor's degrees and who feel like, I don't think I'm qualified to serve on a nonprofit board because it's, traditionally white men in banking or something like that, you know? And it's like, you have to kind of like just counteract like, you know, all of these like mental and systemic barriers that's there. Um, and so it is just about kind of growing the person and then also just giving them access to opportunities that they may not have had before. Um, what we found as we're doing that is some of our people, they're taking advantage of that type of stuff really or really rapidly. Um, we've already had um, two people run for um, kind of city positions where they're sitting on different city committees or um, the various township kind of running things like that. We have, I think like, a number of those people who are serving on boards or who have served are serving on other types of organizational committees that will make decisions around are we funding jails or are we funding schools right <laughs> and things like that and so it's kind of interesting and amazing like to see people step up so ra rapidly um far more rapidly than i think than um we expect it and so like sometimes we're running to catch up with them and it's like oh you're out there how are we supposed to support you out there <laughs> right? but um i guess my thought around this and i don't know if he actually coined the term but he's probably the first person i've heard use it if you know anything about creative mornings um it's here in the year us but it's a global kind of movement by like designer tech people and things like that. Um, and um, he worked also on um, a book called um, Get Together, okay? And so his name is Kevin Hunk, Hunk? <laughs> I'm not pronouncing it right. Um, 
I think the book I listed as a resource, so it will be in like the resource list for for that. Um, but um, he basically has a term called progressive acts of collaboration, a collaboration, right? And um, and I like it because it's basically just a series of six things. You're thinking about how do I accomplish things with people instead of for people. Um, how do, who am I inviting to participate? Um, how do I find new ways for them to contribute so that they get more comfortable in the space and that they start acknowledging that they can have a role in the direction of where you're going and what the organization or what it is that you're trying to accomplish ultimately is. Then figuring out ways to share ownership and power with the people and then, well, actually these should probably be reversed, assigning leadership roles <laughs> to them um, and then setting the stage for them to basically jump up, take charge, become the lead. And it doesn't need to be that they're the lead of your organization, but they can actually take what they've learned from you and create something totally new um, that is still pushing for the same goals that you're pushing for, but in in different ways. And, um, and I've always liked the idea of that approach. It's not about necessarily having everything figured out up front. It's about um, learning about the people that you're working with and then basically coming up with ideas of what might work for them. What is it that they need to feel confident to participate? Um, you know, and it could be anything. It could be that they're going to work every day and like their boss just never wants to hear any of their ideas. So they're pretty certain nobody else wants to hear <laughs> their ideas, right? you know, or they think their ideas aren't good enough or aren't valuable enough. Um, and so it may just be kind of like, you know, small reminders like that you're doing good things, you have great ideas, um, using some of their ideas and then acknowledging that, like, you know, in a small group, in a large group, um, publicly, if possible. Um, I think, you know, I think this is a uh, Simon Sinek, Sinek, yeah, I think it says something like around um, a good leader basically gives out all the praise um, and accepts all of the blame for that. And, you know, and I, I kind of believe that, I mean, to a really large degree, it's something that when um, I was in the Air Force um, and going through officers training and stuff that the Air Force like strongly kind of enforced for us. It's like, if you're going to be an officer, you have to take responsibility for what the people up under you do, right? You can't go back and be like, he did it. <laughs> it's his fault, right? It's like, you're the officer. It's your, it's yours, right? You own it. And there's questions. It's interesting. There's so many great questions for you both that are popping up in the chat. And there's accountability, like what environment. And so Devin's going to jump in because there's so many great conversation pieces. Devin's going to jump in and pull out some questions for the two of you so that you can go deeper um, of learning of what we were asking about. Go ahead, Devin. There's a beautiful tension that we're all living right now between the status quo and the desire for what's next. And there's a great question that Nate shared. Thanks, Nate. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna direct it to whoever has the energy to answer mm -hmm. this. Um, how might we work to shift the current status quo that tends to be more hierarchical when we're in it versus doing it as an alternative paradigm and how do the two function together so i'll put it in the chat to reference for folks it's an it's a heavy one yeah and i don't know if i can go into all of the details i definitely think that some of that it will be more inspirational from alana um i'll be the drag your knees in the dirt 
type of person <laughs> for it <laughs> because I think you just do it a step at a time. Um, per, uh, you know, um, I'm not functioning in collective systems. I actually see, I'm trying to grow like and support new leaders. And um, so I still use a top-down approach occasionally. It's not that much of a top-down. It's kind of like a small hierarchy of things. And it's mostly just to combat what happens when the person wasn't ready for what it is that you were trying to get them to do because stuff still needs to get accomplished right <laughs> and so it's more like the buck falls back to me or somebody or my staff for for that so if you know if we gave somebody too much responsibility or too much work or we didn't like really listen to the signs that this wasn't their area of interest or it wasn't a strong skill or things like that, it falls back to us. And that's something that we kind of keep in mind, like as leaders, this stuff falls back to us and we have to get it accomplished in terms of like the deadlines and the everything else if we, if we push too far too fast. So we're the people who are digging well, I don't want to say digging the ditch, right? <laughs> but, but like, we're the people like who, who will go out and do the heavy lifting if like, you know, if if the people we're working with don't rise to the case, occasion. And that happens. Um, sometimes a lot of our people, I think, do rise to the occasion. Um, but sometimes it's like, you know, you push too fast, you push too far, or there's something going on that you didn't know about. And we're try we try to keep tabs on when we're offering people opportunities or things to do and stuff like that about realistically speaking, if this yeah. falls through, are we willing to let it go or who's going to then take over that, that activity? Um, I love that too, because you're getting at the individual responsibility of us as leaders in a lot of ways. And so Alana, I want to shift that question to you and add on to it with another question that was shared from the group and speak to whichever one calls to you. Um, how do you shift the environment around these new leaders so that these folks are able to access power as well as addressing the status quo changing? Wow, big questions. I mean, <clears throat> I just want to um, say that I really agree with what Anissa was talking about, that um, in, in order to support the growth of new leaders, I think you do need structure. You can't just throw people into the deep end completely undefined. If you're like, okay, you're a leader now, like that's not a really effective way to support people. Um, <clears throat> I think what I, I wrote an article called How to Grow Distributed Leadership, which talks about a model where there's different levels that build on. It starts with self, well, it starts with the very prerequisite is an environment where shared power is actually possible. And uh, assuming we have some of that and that the desire is there and the buy-in is there, because if, if not, then people are just gonna be banging their heads on a brick wall. But assuming that's there, then it starts with self-leadership, talks about how, how do you do leading others uh, in a way that's about being a servant leader and facilitative leader and, and stuff that I'm sure people in this call are experts on already. Um, and then it talks about leading leaders and how do you grow leadership capacity across an organization if the organization doesn't have a leadership hierarchy ladder. Um, and then it talks about ecosystem leadership in terms of how do we spread these ideas between networks and into society. Um, but I just wanna say that, yeah, it's, it's absolutely not easy. And I think that the people, people need to have a very high level of self-awareness of their own accumulation of power um, and how power dynamics are flowing in the group. In order, to, in order to understand how to empower someone, you really need to understand your own power. So you need to understand aspects of your privilege, privilege that are accruing powers to you, whether those come from 
you know, historical structures or whether that's actually just your personality or you're louder or you're extroverted or you're, uh, <clears throat> we're the older sibling and are used to telling people what to do or whatever it is, you gotta be, it's, and, it's, and it's not one time thing, it's a constant practice. Power has to be something that the group can openly talk about without defensiveness. Um, and then deep levels of empathy for other people's relationship to all of those things and where the barriers <clears throat> might be for them. And then a systemic mindset about what in our system is causing some people to rise into more power and some people not and really think about those pathways. So that's what I, when I was talking about that leading leaders level of that model, it's really about that. Um, and when you, when you get to that moment of like, okay, this thing is getting bigger than any one leader can hold on to. We're going to scale. You have a really critical choice. Are you going to bring in middle management and start building a pyramid? Or are you going to really commit to these deep practices of growing distributed leadership and truly true empowerment? And so that can be thought of on the microcosm level of your group, or it could be more on the macrocosm level of like, how, are, how is our organization intersecting with structural power dynamics or like, why is it that when we were trying to recruit a programmer, we're getting to, you know, 125 year old white men and no one else, you know, these are things that you really have to think about. Um, and I'd say, you know, some things about how we do things here in Aotearoa are helpful with that, like because the treaty is a present part of organizational life and like every, pretty much every organization will have a policy about treaty partnership and how are we living up to our treaty obligations and every government department talks about this and every like hiring job ad will be, will, will reference treaty responsibilities and treaty partnership and knowledge of Tao Māori. And I'm not saying that every organization is doing a good job at that or that we're doing enough to any level, but just the fact that it's present in a lot of conversations, like even like I, I work through a little, a tiny little co-op. It's just like, it was three of us. Um, but we sat down and I went, how are we being treaty partners? How are we uh, integrating uh, Tao Māori and the, the rights of indigenous people into our work? And that actually led to changes in how we were doing things. And now my partner works for uh, on a Maori, a really cool Maori tech project. And it's just, just the, having that conversation constantly, I think is a really great way we do it here to connect up those big social power dynamics with the power dynamics present in your small group and your organization. Sorry, that was like a massive rambling answer. I hope I actually answered the question. <laughs> that was amazing. Heather, do we have time for one more question? We have about three minutes before we want to go into our breakout room. So the rooms are ready, but if there's a short question, okay, keep the response quick to three minutes. All right. So whoever has um, between Elnius and Alana, whoever has some energy around this uh, question, I am going to pull a question that y'all shared in the chat and it's around um, uh, equitable pay structures. So what are different models you've seen of equitable, equitable pay structures and what questions should be asked in making new standards? In like two minutes? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, I think I'm a strong proponent that um, and I don't think this is a full on structure, but just kind of a guideline that the top level person in any organization shouldn't make more than twice of the lowest level person in, in the organization. But otherwise I kind of focus more in on really trying to figure out what someone could live on in the area that they're in. Um, without having to forego, you know, things like occasionally going out to eat or somebody asked them out to a movie or a concert. All of these things are kind of expensive these days. And if they're ending up take a home pay is something, I mean, not the take home pay, but after they've paid all of their expenses, if they only have like a hundred dollars left, then that's not the price. <laughs> that's not like the rate you should be paying them. They should be, there should be something higher there. I mean, and I think this is just something a lot of people will go on like market values. And I think you need to do something better than that. Like PayPal, not only just introduce um, allowing people to get their access to their pay 
at the end of the day if they need it so that they don't have to do payday loans. But they also did a survey of their employees and found out that even though they were basically paying them more than what the current market value were, that they found out an embarrassingly number of, the, of their employees were living in cars because they couldn't afford a home. Um, who were using payday loans like something like 40% and even of mid-level mid staff. Like, so think about the janitors <laughs> and things like that. And I think those are, those are things that I think people need to investigate and not just assume about. Like, so when I talk about like minimum salary level for individuals, I'm thinking about it for Madison, Wisconsin in, and I also put win, uh, for a female in Madison, Wisconsin in the equation, because technically speaking, men can like probably live off less, but they rarely have to. <laughs> I can add, add quickly. Um, I absolutely think what Anissa said is a great, a great and important way to think about it in terms of like living wage and fairness and all of these things. And I guess another, another tool that I've uh, used to kind of get everybody on that page is full transparency about all the finances in the organization. Now, these might seem kind of radical, but I don't, I don't feel like they are. Um, and basically putting everybody in charge of the budget together. And if you talk about, well, this is how much money we have. This is how much we want to get done. This is the strategy that we've collectively agreed. This is the people. These are the, we know each other. We know each other's needs. We know each other's lives a little bit. Um, you, I think what you will find is people will surprise you with their ability to think uh, from the perspective of the project and the organization, not just of themselves and to take into account a lot of complexity and to make good decisions together. Um, I created an open source software tool called CoBudget, which is a way that people can come together and collectively decide how a budget's going to go. I've also been uh, in like a co-op member, like a co-owner of a cooperative where everybody is a co-owner. So you all think on that level of, well, we're all here to achieve something bigger than ourselves together. And the organization is the vehicle that we're gonna do it. How are we gonna go about it in a way that is also uh, aligned with our values and aligned with the impact we wanna have in our community and on, and on the people in our organization. Um, so yeah, I guess, yeah, some of these things might seem radical, but I would say, don't be scared. Don't be scared to go for it because people will um, absolutely surprise you with their ability to step up and make those hard decisions together. And then everybody feels like they have ownership. I've seen people voluntarily take pay cuts. I've seen people voluntarily fire themselves because they're not the one to take the organization forward. I've seen people uh, voluntarily have a, a large pay differential because they can understand why that is that way and they've decided that together. So I think it is possible. Love that, love that. So I wanna hear from Alisa. Let us know kind of what's, what are you thinking about after your conversation and after the conversation we've had, what are some takeaways or some pieces that are standing out to you? Um, so yes, yeah, so in the breakout, um, Ramon and I actually talked about the, um, the economic equity component for, for that. And I, I, I thought that was an interesting conversation um, for that. Um, and he mentioned some of the stuff, work that he does like with, He's a, should I call you a data person? <laughs> He's a data wonk. Uh, <laughs> uh, and so we were talking about like how, how like, you know, um, well, actually maybe you can say, you gave it a specific term and I can't remember what that term was. Oh, the, the, the Gini index for, yes. uh, for, for pay equity? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so basically just a way that people who might be interested in fighting more for pay equity in like the nonprofit sector and the social sector, I think as a whole could have data that they can point back to um, and who can also just measure like, are, is their organization being equitable? Um, but I think also equitable is just one of those components because you might have an organization that is being equitable, but is that necessarily fair? Because if like you have an organization where the executive director is getting paid $50,000 and like the, the person who's a step down from them is getting paid 45, but they live in an area where you need like, you know, $65,000 to like 
actually like live, you know, that might be equitable, but it may not be fair. <laughs> uh, really important. What about you, Alana? How was your breakout room and, and what are you thinking about right now? And I love what we're seeing in the chat too. Really great comments, but Alana, jump in and then we'll look at some of the chat. Um, yep, it was a really cool breakout room. We got to talk about a specific case study, which is always my favorite because I am that kind of person who wants to be practical in real world and, and explore ideas that way. Um, and I guess it got me thinking about like, I, I really don't want to be that cheesy person who's like, I read a book, you should read my book. But if you are interested <laughs> in this stuff, uh, I wrote, I co-wrote a book. Um, and the reason I'm suggesting it is because it's very much about those practical case studies and those very human stories about trying to do this kind of pretty radical experimentation and what it's like. Uh, and I think like circling back to what I was saying about the, the sci-fi utopian vision, I think if we want to build up to those kinds of stories and those kinds of realities, we have to share the real stories because we here in this alternative, I don't know what you would call the paradigm we're working in, but we're here and we're, we're trying to build something different or work on an alternative way. And you think about like every MBA program at every university around the world and all the books and everything that's written about that other paradigm and how strong that is in society and how much money is behind it and how much history is behind it. We're over here trying to like build up our canon and our best practice and our ways of being and, and we have to share, we have to put stuff out there and read each other's stuff, I think, to get there. Um, so if you do want to read a bunch of stories about these kinds of experiments and tools we tried and stuff and mistakes we made and blah, 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 you could check out the book. Um, and uh, I guess I I, I, in my career, I tend to interpret those experiences with human collaboration into software. And I'm very interested in the crossover with that technology. And I don't think technology is gonna um, solve any of these issues or tell you what to do, just like the book's not gonna give you the answers or solve your issues, but it's a tool. It's a way in to, just like some of the facilitation practices people might have and stuff like that, to, it's a way into unpacking some of this stuff or enabling different dynamics or lowering barriers. I love that. That's great. And looking in the chat, other people are sharing books. So there's, we'll take all the content from the chat as well as the resources that our lovely speakers have provided. And we'll put it all in an email digest that we'll send to everyone that registered. So you'll have all of that to refer to and continue to, to learn from and with. Um, yeah, how to, how to shift micro and macro. Such an interest. And how to use the gift of the pandemic. I love that framing, the gift of the pandemic. That's really interesting. The silver lining that has come out of some of it. Um, excellent insights about traditional nonprofit models still has a board and the boards over the staff and then there's hierarchy. Yeah, we definitely need to have a whole episode just about the craziness that our boards and what that structure is all about, where it came from and how we can be better and different. Absolutely. Um, and really yeah, really great comments of having it be a messy process absolutely and Charlene sharing another book um, letting the group brainstorm initiatives one of the things that Alnisa had mentioned when we chatted in our speaker chat was that um, having everyone come to the table this proverbial table and there's already a solution at hand so you're bringing people in and saying this is the solution we're going to build this together that's tricky. And I love how Lisa framed it was, what if it's like, this is the problem to be solved. This is the challenge at hand. What superpowers, what ideas, what can we bring? Who's not here? Like, how do we collectively work in new ways to address big challenges instead of just saying, we're here to do this solution? Like, give everyone a moment, right, to get deep and unpack everything. And then, yes, you can come up with really great ways for distributed leadership to, uh, to tackle the solution. So I love that. Um, the very last piece that we want to talk about is uh, our next and our last session for the our last episode is on December the 9th. It's from 11 a.m. Pacific to 1230 Pacific. It's a greatest hits episode, like kind of like a uh, what have we learned? It's going to be just Devin and I. You won't have amazing speakers, you'll be stuck with us, but we're going to talk about what we've learned over these episodes, um, how it's reshaped our thinking, what really great connections have come from it. Um, we have a highlight video that we've created that we're going to start to share of episodes one through six. So it shows like our favorite moments, like the stuff that when our speakers said it, we just were like, oh my 
why like more 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 we need this is filling our cup so we have that video and then uh, we're going to be talking about a new website and some changes for 2021 so um Devin is so on top of it she's already put the registration link and we'll send that in an email as well and you'll see that on LinkedIn but just as a reminder sign up for that um look for the LinkedIn group which Devin will also put and then we are collecting recommendations and ideas from all of you. So there's a link to a Google form. And if you could let us know what topics do you want to hear about? What speakers, uh, which speakers, who should we talk to? Who should we invite? Can it be you? You're super smart and amazing. And we want to include you in these conversations. And you could be a guest on the show as well. So please feel free to self-nominate when you are thinking about topics and ideas. We would love to feature your voice and perspective. And um, we're just so thankful for this growing community. You know, the group on LinkedIn, the group that joined live and through recordings. And we're so thankful to Alnisa and Alana for joining us and, and sharing their wisdom and, and creating some energy around this topic of how we can be better or different. So we have two minutes left. Do you each want to take one minute and share some parting words? One minute each of like, how would you summarize what you think we should do next? Alana first. <laughs> oh, you got me. Uh, um, I think I would just say, I, I, I would love if people could think in an optimistic way about uh, beautiful humanistic um, pro like, things in their everyday life and in the organizations that you encounter your family or any circles that you're in uh small things and just think about how those can build up to bigger things because if you're like me and get very overwhelmed when thinking about the bigness of the big problems i've just found that as a way um to move forward through the day um yep that would be what i'd leave you with i love that it's lovely alnisa i would say believe in people <laughs> i'm I'm an optimist, but I'm also very much um, pragmatic and a realist, I guess, to a degree. And so I wholeheartedly agree that people can be incredibly crappy, but I also believe that <laughs> um, we can be pretty damn incredible and in trying to bring out like the incredible in people is kind of what I try to focus in on, um, you know, but I do cuss and swear at some people as well, like not at them, but in a room at my cat saying, you know, <laughs> so she can give me feedback about them, but, <laughs> you know, but, you know. <laughs> I love that. I love that. People are amazing. People are exquisite. And it's just, it's just like, they're only have um, presence to share with us and wisdom to share with us. And it's just such part of this journey. And that's why we love this work with Possibility Project. We get to all come together and see how amazing and beautiful you all are. And uh, so we want you to join us in December and keep joining us in 2021. And uh, thank you again to our speakers, Alana and Lisa. Love you both. Thank you. And uh, we will send all of you uh, an email with the recording the transcription, you can get the chat once you once we call this off and you will have all the invitations for next steps and resources to get more deeply engaged. So we thank you so much. Take good care, everyone. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.